So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the TCS seminar at uh, Jagiellonian University. We start a new summer semester or spring semester. And uh, uh, we start with a fantastic guest, uh, Jacob Fox. Uh, he graduated from Princeton in 2010. Then he spent uh, some years in uh, at MIT. Now he's a professor at Stanford. He is very well known uh, for his excellent work in uh, all uh, many areas of combinatorics and uh, and graph theory. And today he will tell us about structure theorems for intersection patterns of geometric objects. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you uh, early in the morning here. Um, uh, th thanks, Bartosz, for the introduction. Uh, so I'll be talking about work, which is uh, almost almost entirely, this is joint work with Janusz Pak and Andrew Suk. Um, and uh, great. So um, I'll start with discussing some questions in graph drawing, some problems that have been of great interest for a long time, um, extremal problems. And then we'll uh, get into some uh, structural type questions for uh, intersection patterns of geometric objects, particularly of curves. Okay, great. So uh, topological graph is a graph drawn in the plane. So the vertices are points and the edges are curves that uh, connect its endpoints. So um, they're allowed to intersect each other as many times as you'd like. And a special case of Topological graphs are simple topological graphs if each pair of edges are allowed to cross at most once. An even more special case is known as a geometric graph where uh, the edges have to be segments. Okay. Um, uh, so to start with, we're gonna look at a, a relaxation of planarity. Um, known as uh, quasi k quasi planar topological graphs so a, a topological graph is k quasi planar if no k edges uh pairwise cross so you you don't see these k edges that well i'm trying to draw three but i only have two arms um <laughs> that uh, edges that pairwise cross and so um a, a plane graph which is a graph that's drawn in the plane without crossing edges is just the same thing as a two quasi planar uh, topological graph. And it's known that every planar graph, that's a graph that can be represented as a plane graph on n vertices where n's at least three has at most three n minus six edges. So there's at most a linear number of edges of a planar graph. And um, there's a natural generalization uh, which is still open, it's a conjecture that every k quasi planar topological graph with n vertices has at most a linear number of edges in terms of the number of vertices. So there's a constant that's allowed to depend on k in front um, as a factor. And this conjecture has been uh, proved in the first uh, two interesting cases um, for k equals three and uh, by Pak, Radojcik, and Toth and by Ackerman uh, for k equals four. And this is using the discharging method, which is a, an idea that was used uh, in the proof of the four color theorem, but you have to adapt it in some very clever ways to, to do this here. Um, the current best known upper bound for uh, this problem is not linear, but um, almost linear. It's uh, n times log n to a power, which is roughly log k. So uh, this theorem with with Janos and Andrew, um, uh, uh, you have k is a pa perfect power of two, and so not all k are powers of two, but you can round up to the, the next power of two and, and apply this theorem, uh, which gives an upper bound of the number of edge uh, number of edges of a k quasi planar topological graph. Um, so this is the current state of the art. The way that this is proved um, uh, uses two tools. One of them is a separator theorem. And there was a conjecture by uh, <clears throat> um, by Janusz Pak and myself that was later proved by uh, uh, James Lee and Matushek had got close to this um, about 
uh, separators in string graphs. And so the basic thing that really is going on here has little to do with graph drawing. Um, it really has to do with understanding the intersection patterns of curves. So if we look at the edges, these are curves in a in a in a topological graph, and we can ignore the vertices, just delete them. And if you have a k quasi planar topological graph and you ignore the vertices, the edges are just uh, uh, some collection of curves. And um, the k quasi planar part tells you that there's no uh, clique of size k in the intersection graph of these curves. Um, and it would be nice if knowing that implied that there was a huge independent set inside your intersection graph of curves. The reason is that if you had an independent set, which was linear in the number of, uh, of vertices of the intersection graph, which is the number of edges of our topological graph, um, this independent set, when you go back to the topological graph, that's a set of edges that form a plane graph because there's no crossings anymore. So if you found this large independent set in the intersection graph, and then you know an upper bound on the number of edges of a plane graph, which is this 3n minus 6 that we mentioned earlier. So there's an approach to proving this conjecture that people have been following, and this is how the best known bound comes from. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, so uh, actually, it's two slides over. Um, but we want to understand intersection graphs of curves first. Uh, so a string graph is just an intersection graph of curves in the plane. So uh, in this drawing, there's five curves. And for each curve, you uh, uh, would make a vertex. And uh, two of the curves, you'd put an edge between them if they cross, if they have an at least one intersection point. And so these five curves correspond to the five cycle. Um, and uh, on the right, there's a drawing of a graph that's not a string graph, which is um, you take the one subdivision of K5, the complete graph on five vertices. So this is not a planar graph. And, um, and then when you one subdivide it, you uh, replace every edge by a path uh, with a, a vertex in the middle. Um, this new graph has 15 vertices and uh, it's not a string graph. So, and the reason for that is suppose it was a string graph, then for each of the five original vertices, they would correspond to um, uh, curves in the plane that are now, originally they were, uh, they formed a clique, but now in this one subdivision, they're not adjacent. So these five curves uh, would be uh, pairwise disjoint curves in the plane. And then between each pair of them, there would be another curve that intersects precisely that pair. And when you uh, contract each of these five original curves to a, two single points, you would get a drawing of K5 uh, without crossings if uh, this was the um, intersection graph of those curves. So, so when you one subdivide or, or take any subdivision of uh, where you subdivide every edge at least once of a non-planar graph, you're not gonna get a string graph. Um, uh, so not all graphs are string graphs. Um, and uh, the original motivation for studying these came from some real world applications. Uh, Benzer was interested in the top topology of genetic structures, and Sindin uh, was interested in electrical networks realizable by printed circuits and naturally came to studying these graphs. Um, now, uh, uh, we wanted to, we were hoping that in order to try to prove this uh, K quasi planar conjecture, that um, if you have a KK free string graph with n vertices, that you could find a linear size subset. Uh, which forms an independent set. So you'd like to say that the independence number is linear, the number of vertices. And um, well, there's a bound that's almost linear. It's n divided by some polylog uh, n, where the exponent is um, logarithmic in k. And uh, this is the best known bound for this problem, um, what's written in the middle here. Uh, and there's a reason why we're not proving uh, a linear bound. And there's this uh, very nice result, uh, which um, was surprising, or rather the, the precursor to this was very surprising to everyone who worked in this. There was a longstanding question of, of uh, Paul Erdős whether there are tr uh, triangle-free intersection graphs of segments in the plane of arbitrarily large chromatic number. 
And Bartaj and his collaborators uh, in that paper uh, uh, showed that the answer is that there are su uh, such intersection graphs. And um, soon after Bartaj had this construction, which gives a slightly stronger result that in fact, there are triangle free intersection graphs of n segments in the plane whose independence number is sublinear, little o n. So um, this, uh, in some sense, destroys this approach to trying to prove the quasi-planar conjecture for topological graphs, but um, there's still some room to improve on the bounds uh, potentially here. Um, so uh, that's what happens for k quasi-planar topological graphs. And you can ask, that's about k crossing edges. What about other patterns that you'd like to avoid in graph drawings? How many edges can you have in a, in a graph drawn in a plane, which avoids certain types of substructures. And the natural thing to study besides uh, K crossing edges, the next thing to look at is K disjoint edges. Um, and so uh, to do that, uh, it makes sense to look only at simple topological graphs. And the reason is that there are examples of drawings of uh, complete graphs in which every pair of edges cross at least once and at most twice. Um, and so uh, um, uh, it, you really wanna study simple topological graphs. So every pair of edges cross at most once for this to be an interesting problem. And a thrackle is a special case similar to planar graphs uh, was an interesting uh, case that people have studied of uh, a plane graph. Um, a thrackle is a simple topological graph with no two disjoint edges. So it's in a sense the opposite of what you would get for a plane graph. And um, there's this Conway thrackle conjecture where uh, John Conway had offered $1,000 and still open. And in a thrackle, the number of edges is at most the number of vertices. And um, currently it's known to be at most some constant times the number of vertices, the number of edges, and this constant has been improved over time. Um, a natural generalization that people have studied is a K quasi thrackle if no K edges are pairwise disjoint in a simple topological graph. Um, and uh, until this very recent work with Janos and Andrew uh, Suk, um, the uh, best known bound on the number of edges of a K quasi thrackle on n vertices uh, was at most n times log n to the big OK. And uh, in this uh, work, we improve the exponent of log n from, from being linear in K to logarithmic in K. Uh, and so um, I, I wanna say uh, a little bit about how these things are proved. Why does, where does log K come from or, or K come from in these sorts of, uh, uh, problems. Um, well, for the K quasi planar problem, uh, if almost all pairs of edges are disjoint, you can use either a separator theorem or a bisection width theorem. They're roughly the same thing. And you can partition the graph into two halves, more or less, with few edges between them. Um, and uh, in doing this, uh, you can apply induction. Uh, and, and some recursive bounds. So if there's not too many crossing edges, then um, then you can uh, 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 basically win inductively that there, there's these nice separator by section width arguments. Um, however, if there are a lot of crossing edges, then, well, there's gonna be one edge that crosses many other edges, and then you could use that one edge um, and, and see that the edges that cross it give you, a, a, if you originally had a K quasi planar topological graph, those edges that cross it would be a K minus one uh, quasi planar topological graph and you'd lose some logarithmic factors. Um, that's what the previous approach did for quasi planar. Um, and then what was learned, what, what we dis discovered over time is that actually uh, in, if you have a dense or, or somewhat dense, um, uh, a string graph that there are actually two large sets of, of edges, uh, two large sets of vertices that are gonna be complete to each other. And that allows you to um, uh, get two large sets of edges that completely cross each other. And uh, in one of those sets, if you're originally K quasi planar, one of those sets would be at most K over two quasi planar. And so you end up 
you lose a few logarithmic factors, but but you end up uh, going from k to k over two um, in doing that. So that's where the log k comes from. And you'd like a similar approach for these quasi thrackle. The problem is that um, it's not symmetric. Uh, it's not the case that string graphs, the complement of a string graph is, is another string graph. Uh, and so uh, we don't have separator theorems for complements of string graphs like we do for string graphs. And so it makes it harder to understand uh, how to deal with this. Um, and there was a technique that was introduced by Janusz Pak and Geza Toth um, using the uh, uh, a bisection width bound using the odd crossing number, which is um, instead of the crossing number of a graph, which is uh, has to do with the number of crossings you get in a drawing, um, you look at the number of pairs that cross an odd number of times and you wanna minimize that. That's the odd crossing number. And if that's small, then you can partition your graph into two basically equal parts so that there's few edges between them. That's what the bisection width is, 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 is telling you. And so um, uh, there's this technique that they have that uh, goes from uh, having few, um, you can start off with a bipartite uh, 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 simple topological graph, which might have few, um, uh, uh, disjoint pairs of edges, and then you can uh, make it so that you add an additional crossing for each pair of these by adding a twist. And now every pair of edges is going to cross either one or two times. But um, before you had a uh, few that cross zero times, now you'll have few that cross one time, and then you can use the odd crossing number in that case. The problem is that then you just, you still get a lot of pairs of um, of of edges that you get down to the case that you get a lot of pairs of edges that are disjoint and you like to instead of just taking one of the edges that's disjoint from many to get two large sets of edges that are disjoint from each other and that's really uh what the the heart of this uh problem then became for us to try to prove this was to understand that if you have um uh an intersection graph of pseudo segments so these are uh, curves, each pair of them cross at most once, each pair of them cross at most once. And um, there are, it's the, the, inter, the complement of this intersection graph is, is somewhat dense, then there's going to be two large sets of uh, um, edges that are, are uh, uh, <clears throat> that are, are disjoint from each other in the, in the, uh, in the simple topological graph. Um, and so we end up coming down to uh, uh, looking at studying some other questions about intersection graphs of pseudo segments. And so that's where um, the next main theorem uh, uh, comes from. And uh, so uh, a set of curves in the plane, we said, um, is a collection of pseudo segments if any pair of them have at most one point in common. So uh, um, they're like segments, pairs of segments cross at most once, uh, um, but but they're still curves, so they're allowed to um, not, they don't have to be straight. Um, right, so we have this new structure theorem for intersection graphs of pseudo segments. Um, so what does it say? Uh, if you have a collection for each epsilon greater than zero, there's a K that depends on epsilon, such that for any finite collection of pseudo segments in the plane, there's an equitable partition of the collection into k parts. So equitable here means that the parts uh, differ in size by at most one, um, such that for all but at most an epsilon fraction of the pairs of parts, either every curve in, in, in the CI crosses every curve in CJ or every curve in CI is just joint from every curve in CJ. So if you look at the intersection graph, you've partitioned the set of vertices into a bounded number of parts of roughly equal size. And uh, between almost all pairs of parts, they're either complete between them or empty in the intersection graph. So it's a very strong regularity uh, type partition. Um, and so this is uh, a strengthening of Semmerais regularity lemma in the case of intersection graphs of pseudo segments. Semmerais regularity lemma gives you a partition of any graph into a bounded number of parts. But instead of saying that, uh, and it's, well, it says again that all but an epsilon fraction of the pairs of parts 
um, have some nice property. And instead of having it complete or empty, it has this property, which is epsilon regular, which is basically saying that the graph looks quasi random of some density um, up to this epsilon. And uh, in this version, you have uh, density zero or one. Uh, in fact, it's, it's complete or empty. So it's really a very uh, strong regularity lemma for these um, intersection graphs of pseudo segments. And this was proved earlier by Pak and Shoimoshi for the case of segments. Um, so you have this nice regularity lemma uh, with complete or empty um, pairs of parts uh, proved earlier. Uh, the, this, this sort of thing was later generalized to by Alon, Pak, Pinkazi, Radojcik, and Sharir um, to intersection, uh, to semi-algebraic graphs of bounded description complexity. Um, uh, but those are all algebraically defined. And there are results that say that semi-algebraic graphs of bounded description complexity are, are actually pretty small families of graphs. So if you look at semi-algebraic graphs of bounded description complexity, Warren's theorem implies that the number of them on with n vertices is going to be n to the big O of n. And um, uh, these intersection graphs of pseudo segments, there's actually a lot more of them. So in, uh, a, in a, another paper, uh, Janos, Andrew and I have shown that the number of intersection graphs of pseudo segments is at least two to the constant times n to the four thirds. So there's a lot more intersection graphs of pseudo segments than there are um, semi-algebraic graphs of bounded description complexity, but, uh, but still they have this nice regularity partition. Uh, similar to what we already knew semi-algebraic graphs of bounded description complexity have. Um, great. Are there any questions uh, uh, about this uh, so far? I've talked pretty quickly. Uh, is there an analogous conjecture about a linear uh, some 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 uh, linear number of uh, edges in these uh, k quasi throuples yes so that's a uh would be a very natural conjecture yes yeah okay. so, that, so that's what the, the results in the direction of and we don't know if that's true okay okay because you show some like a uh, linear logarithmic upper bound but but exactly. there, there is very no similar lower, there is no we... super linear lower bound for that that's right there's no super linear lower bound and and um and that would be nice. And we don't even know it for uh, three. So we don't know if we have, uh, um, if we know we have a simple topological graph in which any three edges uh, have two, two of them intersecting, um, that uh, uh, the number of edges should uh, is at most linear, the number of vertices. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of things here we don't know. So, um, uh, for some of the results around pseudo segments have been, uh, intersection graphs of pseudo segments have been extended to, um, uh, where each pair of the curves is allowed to cross a bounded number of times. And this new theorem, we don't know how to prove, uh, for that. So if I told you instead that they are allowed to cross at, instead of at most once, at most twice, we don't have this theorem for that. Um, some of the parts of the proof, uh, which is pretty technical, go through, and some other parts, uh, we don't know how to, to make that, them work yet for that. So um, it seems uh, challenging, actually, to do. So um, there are a, 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 still a lot of interesting open problems here. Uh, and so I want to uh, not only share some new results, but also um, uh, highlight some of the very interesting problems in this area. Um, Great. Any other questions or, or comments before we move on? Okay. Um, okay, great. Uh, so, um, so before going into some of the ideas that go into understanding uh, this result, um, I want to also talk about uh, what we knew previously that was related to this result. Um, and there's a weaker regularity lemma that holds, uh, that was already known to hold uh, for intersection graphs of pseudo segments, 
um, which do not give you complete or empty between the pairs of parts, but uh, give you almost complete or almost empty. And this uses the notion of a uh, of VC dimension of a, of a, of a graph. So um, uh, we first need to understand what a, the VC dimension of a family of sets is. So let F be a family of sets. A subset S of the ground set is said to be shattered if for every subset of S, so there's gonna be two to the size of S subsets, S prime, for every such subset um, S prime, there is uh, some T in your, uh, family F such that the intersection of T with S is going to be S prime. And the VC dimension of this uh, should not have been a uh, math cal, it should have just been the same F as before, is the maximum size of a shattered set. Um, so, so that's what the VC dimension of a family of sets is. And for a graph, you can come up with the VC dimension by for each vertex, you take the neighborhood the, the set of vertices that are adjacent to it. And so if you have a graph G with N vertices, um, you get a family associated to that of the neighborhoods of the vertices that gives you N sets, which are each the neighborhood of a vertex. And you look at the VC dimension of that family of sets. Um, uh, and so that's a dimension of a graph. Uh, okay. And then, um, we so in terms of regularity, we have this idea of a homogeneous uh, that between two sets you'd be homogeneous that all the edges are there or none of them are, um, and there's a notion of an approximate version of this that x and y subsets of your vertex set is epsilon homogeneous if the edge density, the fraction of pairs in x times y that are edges, is either less than epsilon or at least or greater than one minus epsilon. Um, and so we would say an equitable vertex partition of our graph uh, is epsilon homogeneous if all but an epsilon fraction of the pairs of parts are epsilon homogeneous. So similar to the uh, regularity lemma we saw earlier, the structure theorem where we partition for, for pseudo segments where we partitioned into a bounded number of, of parts that were complete or empty between each pair. This is saying it's almost complete or almost empty up to this epsilon between um, not each pair, but all but an epsilon fraction of the pairs of parts. And um, there's this uh, regularity lemma for graphs of bounded VC dimension that every graph of dimension D has an epsilon homogeneous partition with um, at most a polynomial and one over epsilon parts where the exponent is roughly D. Um, and uh, the original proof of Lovacegedi has uh, a worse bound where set of D is D squared and the, the uh, proof is, is more involved. So we have a simpler proof. It starts with the same ideas, but um, finishes much earlier than uh, they, they had some additional ideas that turned out not to be needed um, in their proof. Uh, and then there was a bipartite version of this uh, that was proved uh, earlier by Alon, F uh, Fisher, Newman for bipartite graphs. Um, and so uh, why is this relevant here? Well, intersection graphs of pseudo segments have uh, bounded VC dimension. And so uh, uh, so so they have such a partition, which is close to the type of partition we have earlier, except it's not complete or empty uh, between almost all the pairs of parts. It's just almost complete or almost empty. And that's not enough for this application for K quasi thrackles that we wanted to have. So it's um, it was important that for our, for our application that we wanted to prove that we get the stronger theorem. Uh, this slide is uh, uh, um, outlining the proof of this result. So uh, that we mentioned earlier, this regularity lemma, uh, because it's uh, uh, it's now short and enough and simple enough that I can uh, sketch it here. Um, so the conjectures that, uh, I mean, the theorem, sorry, is that every graph of dimension of uh, VC dimension D has an epsilon homogeneous partition with some small number of parts. And the proof uh, uses this Hausler packing lemma. Um, if you have S, which is a family of subsets of, of one through N, um, it's said to be delta separated if for any two uh, sets in your family, their symmetric difference has size at least delta times n, so that they, they're not really close to being the same set. 
And the Hauser packing lemma tells you if uh, you have a family of sets that has VC dimension D um, and it's uh, uh, delta separated, uh, um, then uh, the size of the, the uh, uh, and you have a subset of your family um, which is delta separated, then it can't be large. It has to have at most delta to the minus d essentially uh, parts. Uh, sorry, size. So number of, of sets is at most delta to the minus d. So it's uh, small. And um, so how do we get the regularity partition? Well, uh, if we have a graph G of dimension d, we look at the neighborhood uh, of each vertex that gives us our family of sets. Um, we take a maximum uh, delta separated uh, 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 set of these um, neighborhoods. And then um, for, for each vertex of our graph, there's going to be one of the uh, uh, vertices in our maximal collection that um, where its neighborhood has symmetric difference with that vertex at most delta times the size of V. And then by the triangle inequality, any two vertices that are close to the um, same uh, uh, neighborhood in terms of their neighborhoods, um, would have at most uh, two delta times the size of V uh, in terms of the symmetric difference. So you would want to apply the Hauser packing lemma with not delta, but delta over two. And um, you then get this vertex partition where you basically decide, you, you put each vertex uh, near the vertex that it's close to in S. Um, and so that gives a vertex partition. Uh, and um, now any two vertices in the same part have roughly the same neighborhood up to uh, delta. They have the same neighborhood and you apply this with a, 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 um, with a small delta th that uh, is basically gonna be your epsilon. Now, um, why does this vertex partition have the property that we're looking for that between almost all pairs of parts, they're basically homogeneous, um, uh, they're epsilon homogeneous between them? Um, well, uh, if we pick up uh, parts X and Y from our partition uniformly at random and pick vertices uh, X and X prime from X and Y and Y prime from Y uh, uniformly at random, we're gonna look at the three triples, sorry, the three pairs, um, X, Y, X prime Y and X prime Y prime. Um, and then X, Y is gonna be epsilon homogeneous is gonna tell us that the probability of E1 and E3, when we take two pairs, so if it's if the edge density is at most epsilon, it's very unlikely that they'll be the same, uh, that they'll be different, that one will be an edge and one will be not an edge. And uh, precisely, um, there's gonna be probability if it's epsilon homogeneous between them, that they're gonna, the adjacencies of E1 and E3 different are different so that one of them is an edge and one of them is not an edge is at most two epsilon times one minus epsilon. And then you can see that the probability that E1 and E3 differ adjacency is at most the probability that E1 and E2 differ adjacency plus the probability that E2 and E3 differ in adjacency. And uh, E1 and E2 differ in adjacency. Well, E1 and E2, if we look back, that's saying uh, X to Y and X prime to Y. So um, what we're doing is we're picking two vertices, X and X prime in the same part, X at random and then picking y uniformly at random, essentially from the rest of the graph. Um, in doing this, uh, because each pair of vertices in the same part are close, we know that it's unlikely that y is gonna differ on adjacency between x and x prime uh, because of uh, how we got this from this corollary. Every pair we knew had roughly the same neighborhood. And so we would get that E1 and E2 the probability that the E1 and E2 differ adjacency is small. And similarly, uh, E2 and E3, they share um, X prime in common. And so uh, uh, they, sorry, they, they share X prime in problem. So Y and Y prime will uh, necessarily have almost the same neighborhood. And so it's unlikely that um, they differ in adjacency. Anyway, so this is a sketch of the proof, uh, it, um, and uh, uh, one has to add in a little bit of detail here, but uh, but this is the main idea. 
um, to, to prove uh, this VC dimension result. Now, there's a lot of nice um, uh, characterizations of graphs of bounded VC dimension. We have a definition of what it means um, to have dimension D, but uh, there are other equivalent uh, forms to say that a, a, a family of graphs have bounded VC dimension. Um, and so if we have a hereditary family of graphs, that just means it's closed under uh, taking and do subgraphs, um, the following are gonna be equivalent. Uh, so F has bounded VC dimension. So there's some D for which uh, F, every graph in F has dimension at most D. Um, it's equivalent that you forbid all bipartite graphs, all forbidden split, uh, you, you, sorry. It's equivalent that F has a forbidden bipartite graph. So there's some bipartite graph that's not an F that there's a, a split graph that's not an F. A split graph is a graph that can be partitioned into a clique in an independent set. It's, there's edges between them. And, uh, and then there's also a complement of a bipartite graph that's not an F. Um, so these two are equivalent. Uh, if you had all bipartite graphs, you can see that um, then if you look at all bipartite graphs, if you take some subset, you could find uh, vertices that have precisely whatever subset you have in the neighborhood you'd look like uh, to have. So um, you would end up getting unbounded VC dimension. And similarly for these other two families, but if you forbid, uh, uh, there's some Ramsey type argument to show that these are equivalent, but um, it's not too difficult to show that these are equivalent. Um, there's some other characterizations as well. Uh, uh, every graph in F emits a bounded epsilon homogeneous partition um, is also equivalent. Um, if you had all bipartite graphs, it's clear that you're not going to be able to partition uh, where the densities are close to zero or one. If you take a random bipartite graph and then you partition uh, the vertex set, you're still going to get lots of things of density, roughly a half between them. Um, and so you're, you're, uh, uh, you're not going to get such a partition. Um, and then also, uh, uh, you also get an epsilon regular partition in, in the sense of Samaretti with a polynomial number of parts um, if you have bounded VC dimension. And this is also a characterization. Uh, well, we saw one direction already if you have bounded VC dimension. Um, if you have all bipartite graphs, uh, you can show that in the regularity lemma, you'll require having a tower type bound on the number of parts. And so for hereditary families of graphs, there's some uh, jump between how many parts you need. It's either going to be tower type, an exponential tower of twos of height, a power of one over epsilon, or it's going to drop down to polynomial in one over, in, in one over epsilon. So it's, uh, <laughs> there's nothing in between. Um, and the, the last thing is that there's not so many graphs in your family. So uh, if you have all bipartite graphs, you have uh, two to the n squared over four, uh, roughly, uh, bipartite graphs on n vertices. Um, and so uh, if if you're, you're not bounded VC dimension, you're going to get at least two to the n squared over four. But if you do have bounded VC dimension, the number of graphs in F on n vertices is two to the little o n squared. In fact, it's at most two to the n squared minus some epsilon that depends on the family. So it's much smaller. So it's saying that there's not so many graphs up to uh, on n vertices um, in your family. So there's these nice uh, uh, equivalent uh, characterizations of uh, families of graphs of bounded VC dimension that say that they're special in different ways and they're small and they have some nice properties. Um, still, these are not enough for the structure theorem we wanted for intersection graphs of pseudo segments. Um, and so it was helpful to look at some uh, general properties of uh, hereditary families of graphs and understand uh, uh, how these properties relate to each other um, in terms of uh, trying to prove the structure theorem that we mentioned earlier for intersection graphs of pseudo segments. So uh, I want to talk about that. There's a famous conjecture, the Erdős Heinel conjecture. Um, and uh, basically, we'll look at that and some generalizations of it and how they relate to each other. Um, some strengthenings of it, not generalizations, but strengthenings of these properties. Um, so uh, a family of graphs uh, is said to have the Erdős Heinel property if there is some constant C depending on the family such that every graph in, in the family on n vertices has a clique or independent set of size n to the constant. So uh, a graph on n vertices, you, you're often interested in how big of a, a pattern can you find in there. Uh, the natural things to look for are things like cliques, complete graphs or independent sets where there's no edges. 
Um, uh, by Ramsey's theorem, we know that there's going to be a large clicker independent set, but large only means logarithmic in n. Log n, log base two of n divided by two is what we know. And um, and if you look at uh, uh, random graphs, then um, then uh, they almost surely have no clicker independent set of size two times log base two of n. So only logarithmic is kind of what you get for general graphs. But if uh, uh, you're looking here for a special property that actually you get these much larger power size clicks or independent sets. And the erdos heinel conjecture, one formulation of it uh, is that every proper hereditary family of graphs, so hereditary family of graphs closed under, it means enclosed under induced subgraphs and proper means that it's not the family of all graphs. Um, so there's at least one graph forbidden. Uh, so it says that every property, proper hereditary family of graphs has the erdos heinel property. Uh, uh, that's the conjecture. And one special case of interest here is that uh, by uh, Isvan Taman, that the family of string graphs has the erdos heinel property. So uh, this was a conjecture that I was interested in, and we had made some progress in that direction, but uh, couldn't prove it. And then Isvan came up with a beautiful uh, uh, proof um, that led to more developments uh, around the erdos heinel conjecture later. Um, now, a strengthening of the erdos heinel property is uh, the polynomial Riddle property. Um, so a family of graphs is said to have the polynomial Riddle property if there's some constant, such that for every epsilon greater than zero, every graph on n vertices has a linear-sized induced subgraph. Um, so linear means some delta times n, uh, delta depending on epsilon and c. But this delta... Um, is actually a power of epsilon in this form formulation. So epsilon to the c times n uh, vertices with edge density at most epsilon or at least one minus epsilon. So it's almost complete or almost empty. Um, and uh, why is it called, uh, why is it named after Riddle? Riddle proved that there's going to be some delta depending on epsilon um, such that you'll have uh, this induced subgraph with edge n say most epsilon or at least one minus epsilon that's of linear size, at least delta times n. But his result doesn't promise a polynomial dependence on epsilon. In fact, uh, he uses a summary's regularity lemma in the proof, and so it gave a tower type bound. And so um, one question is that whether uh, there's this nice dependence uh, where it's polynomial here. Um, and uh, ben, uh, Benny Sudikov and I had conjectured um, that every proper hereditary family of graphs has the polynomial Riddle property. And we proved a much better than tower type bound at the time uh, on this. But um, uh, this conjecture is still open. And um, very recently, uh, so it's, it's, it's easy to show that it implies the erdos heinel property. You apply, if you knew you had the pro polynomial Riddle property, you apply it with epsilon, some small power of n, you get this uh, reasonably large induced subgraph that uh, has density at most epsilon or at least one minus epsilon in there. And it's um, uh, you can pull out a large uh, clicker independent set of size, basically one over epsilon in that case. Um, and uh, recently uh, we proved uh, with Matya Buchik and, and Hoi, Hoi Pham, uh, we proved that actually they're equivalent. So um, the hereditary family of graphs has a polynomial riddle property if and only if it has the erdos heinel property. And even there's a tight dependence on the between the constants involved. So you don't lose anything on these constants in the exponent. There's some logarithmic factors you lose, uh, but the actual C, big C and little c in these uh, definitions, they remain the same if you go back and forth between these two properties, the fact that they're equivalent. Um, so they're tightly related. Um, and uh, uh, one corollary of this fact is that the family of string graphs has the polynomial riddle property. So this um, one nice part of this is now you can go back and forth between the erdos heinel uh, property and this polynomial riddle property, um, whichever one's more convenient to work with, you know it's equivalent to the other one. Um, there's even stronger properties that people have looked at that imply the polynomial riddle property. Um, and one of them is the strong erdos heinel property. A family of graphs uh, has the strong erdos heinel property if there's some constant, uh, depending on your family, such that every graph in your family on n vertices 
has a, a balanced, complete, or empty bipartite graph with a linear number of vertices. So you have this graph on n vertices, um, and every graph in your family, you can find these two linear size subsets that are complete or empty to each other. Um, and then uh, it's not difficult to show that every hereditary family of graphs with a strong Erdős-Heinel property must also have the polynomial riddle property. You basically iterate what you have uh, this property. So you get two large sets that are complete or empty to each other. You do it again inside. They may be uh, em the opposite inside, but it can only reverse uh, every other time essentially. So you can end up getting some number of parts where they're complete or empty between them. Um, uh, and then not, and you can grow the number of parts by iterating the strong erdős heinel property using the fact that it's hereditary. Um, Janos, Pock, and Geza Toth showed that the family of string graphs does not have the strong erdős heinel property. So it's, it's a stronger property, um, a strictly stronger property. And, uh, uh, but Chaba Toth, Janos, Pock, and I proved that the family of intersection graphs of pseudo segments has the strong erdős heinel property which is close to what we want um, for understanding these quasi-thrackles, these K-quasi-thrackles. Unfortunately, it's not enough. And um, what you really want is something even stronger than the strong air to shinal property uh, to make this work. And so we introduced recently, uh, Andrew Suk, Janusz Pak and I um, introduced uh, the, oops, there's something wrong with the PDF. Sorry. Are you guys there? Hello? Yes. yes, yes. Yes. Okay, you're there. Um, there's, I think, maybe something wrong with the PDF file, possibly. Um, I'm trying to see. Uh, sorry. Um, I'm going to close the PDF and try to open it again. Okay. Do you see the PDF right now? Yes. Okay. Um, somehow something wasn't displaying properly on my side, at least. Okay. Now I'm back in full screen mode. But not us. Okay. Can you see no. the full screen now? Yes. Yes. No. Okay. It's great. Okay. Good. Sorry for the delay. Um, so there's a strengthening of the strong Erdős Heinel property, which we call the mighty Erdős Heinel property. A family F of graphs has the mighty Erdős Erdős Heinel property if there's some constant such that for every graph in your family, and whenever you take two vertex subsets of your graph that are of equal size, they're going to be a these large subsets of these two vertex subsets that are complete or empty to each other. Um, uh, so they're at least a C fraction of the, of the part sizes. So it's some uh, bipartite version of the strong erdős heinel property. Instead of saying within the whole graph, you find these two sets that are complete or empty. Whenever you take two large sets, then you take large subsets of those, you're going to get, um, when you take two, two sets and you take two subsets of those, you're going to get uh, two large, you can find large subsets that are complete or empty between them. So it's, it looks a little bit stronger than the uh, strong erdős heinel property. It is strictly stronger. Um, uh, a property, in fact, uh, a simple example to show that it's strictly stronger is the family of bipartite graphs has the, uh, strong erdős heinel property, um, but does not have the mighty erdős heinel property. Um, and so if you look at bipartite graphs, you get these linear size independent sets automatically. Uh, and so you can find these large empty uh, uh, bipartite structures there. But whenever you, if you take, you know, a random uh, bipartite graph and you then take each side, you won't be able to find large subsets of each side and large here meaning a linear fraction that would be complete or empty between them. You'd have to drop down to logarithmic in that case. Um, so this is a stronger property than the strong Erdős Heinel property. 
And um, uh, and, and a, a, an example that was proved to have this property is uh, the family of semi-algebraic graphs of bounded description complexity. And our main result um, is that actually uh, we, we stated it as a structure theorem, but actually it's a same as saying that uh, you have the mighty erdos heinel property, um, that the family of intersection graphs of pseudo-segments has the mighty erdos heinel property. Um, now there are other uh, properties that one can consider that are also very strong. Um, one is the uh, uh, homogeneous regularity property. A family of graphs has the homogeneous regularity property. If for every epsilon greater than zero, there's gonna be a K depending on epsilon and F, such that the vertex set of every graph in your family has a equitable partition into K parts so that, um, they're complete or empty between all but a epsilon fraction of the pairs of parts. So the same as what we had for this intersection graphs of, of pseudo segments, we can ask uh, this as a general property that, that you have this homogeneous regularity property. And um, we saw earlier that for bounded VC dimension, it was equivalent to having an epsilon homogeneous uh, regularity property in that you don't require complete or empty between all between the, most of these parts, but just that it's close to being co com complete or empty between most pairs of parts. Um, and, and so this is this this is a stronger property here. Uh, and a third property is a kind of a Turan type property. Um, a family F of graphs has the homogeneous density property. If there's some constant depending on the family, such that for every epsilon greater than zero, every graph in G uh, and uh, in, in your family and every pair of vertex subsets of equal size of um, that have at least an epsilon density between them, you can find uh, linear size subsets that are complete to each other. Um, and linear here is with a, a, a power dependence. So uh, epsilon to the constant C um, uh, dependence here. And uh, the last theorem that uh, is a lot, uh, helps us get between these things is that these three last properties that looked very strong are in a sense equivalent to each other. Um, uh, and so you can go between them. And that was very helpful uh, for proving this result about intersection graphs of pseudo segments um, that you can pick the one that, that's easiest to work with uh, basically. Um, so if uh, we, we're gonna let F bar for a family of graphs be the family consisting of the complements of the elements of F. Um, so, so if you have a graph G and F, then the complement of G is in F bar. That's what's meant here. It's not meant to be the, the, the graphs not in F. It's the complements of the graphs in F. Um, and so if we have a hereditary family of graphs and the following uh, three things are equivalent, F has the mighty erdos heinel property, F has the homogeneous regularity property, and F and this F bar both have the homogeneous density property. And so these three things are, are turn out to be equivalent. It's actually not hard to prove this. And um, it's also not hard to change these things a little bit. Like in the homogeneous density property, we uh, uh, required that the, um, if you go back, that the dependence here but, uh, in, in A prime and B prime, the size of them is at least epsilon to the C times the size of A. A and B are the same size. Um, Actually, any dependence on epsilon and F would work, uh, and it is a, turns out to be equivalent here. So if you get any function, it has to end up being polynomial um, in, in epsilon, which is uh, kind of a neat thing that comes out of this. But um, uh, anyway, so you have these stronger properties, and it turns out that they're all equivalent, and it's helpful to go between them um, in terms of the proof. The thing that we really uh, needed to work with in the end was um, this last, the third property that the, has the homogeneous density property in terms of proving the um, result about intersection graphs of uh, the structure theorem for intersection graphs of pseudo segments. Um, uh, unfortunately, the proof that it has a homogeneous density property is pretty involved case analysis. Um, and you look at curves and how they intersect a given curve and uh, you keep pl plugging away at it. Um, and at various points, you can pass to subsets of your uh, curves that um, the intersection graph of those is close to being complete or empty using this Rodel property and 
Um, anyway, so there's a, there, unfortunately the proof is too long to go through in, in any uh, detail, but um, I think I'll end with that. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much.